Hi folks, this is Mrs. Johnson. We are finishing up the review of the intermolecular forces activity that I sent you home with over the long weekend. So we're going to go over some of the problems now. I want to start off with um, a couple of the exercises. So we're going to do exercise two first. Um, exercise 2 says both cis 1,2-dichloroethylene and trans 1,2-dichloroethylene have the same molecular formula. Uh, the cis one has a dipole moment where the trans compound doesn't. And then you have to identify which one has the higher boiling point. So again, just a little bit of an organic um, introduction. I drew out these molecules here for you. So what we have on this side is the trans molecule. And this is a line structure again. So what you'll notice is that at the junction between two bonds, we should have a C here, but we leave out the C for the sake of space. So then here's another junction. We would have a C here. And these two carbons are double bonded. Um, the other bond coming off each of the carbon goes to a chlorine. And in this case we call this molecule the, the trans molecule because the chlorines are on opposite 3D sides of the structure. So trans means opposite or other um, that represents the chlorines on opposite sides. Here on the cis molecule you could draw in your carbons here and here if you wanted. And as a side note each of these carbons would have to be attached to um, an, a hydrogen as well. Um, I'm just not drawing those in for the sake of space. The cis molecule, same exact formula, um, we have the carbons double bonded to each other, but the chlorines are on the same sides of the molecule in 3D space. Uh, so what we see here is that the cis molecule is a polar molecule. It has a permanent dipole moment because these chlorines are very electronegative and pull electron density towards them. So if we were to put this molecule in an electric field, it would line up, or the molecules, excuse me, would line up with the electric field. Um, this negative side would align with a positive plate. This side would align with the negatively charged plate. If we put the trans molecule in an electric field, it would just keep spinning around, spinning around, spinning around. There's no good orientation. So we would say that this is a nonpolar molecule. Just from knowing that one is polar and one is nonpolar, we should recognize that there's going to be a difference in boiling points um, for samples of these compounds. So what we should realize is that since the cis molecule is polar, it's going to have dipole-dipole intermolecular forces with other cis molecules. That's going to increase the boiling point because those molecules are more sticky, you could say. Don't put that in an answer to an AP problem, but you can think about it this way. Um, in this molecule, Nonpolar, it's going to have the lower boiling point. So hopefully you identified those correctly. The next problem that I want to go over is on the same page, it's exercise three. So 3A um, gives us four different molecules and asks us to rank them in order of increasing boiling point. So to approach these types of problems, draw out the molecules that you have and identify the forces that are present um, or would be present in samples of each molecule. So here for the first one, I have some molecules drawn out for you. Adjust my screen a little. There we go. Um, so here's NH3, here's helium, here is methane, which hopefully we realize from our organic talk, methane, it's an alkane, only carbon and hydrogen. Meth stands for one carbon, and then it's saturated with four hydrogens. So methane, and then CH3F. So let's go through and figure out which um, type of intermolecular forces each of these molecules is going to have. So for NH3, we see um, NH bonds and a lone pair. So we know automatically that molecule is polar. It's going to have dipole, um, dipole interactions if you put it in a sample with other NH3 molecules. Now we need to think about is it just dipole-dipole or is it going to be hydrogen bonding? And in this case, We've got the polar moment, or the, the dipole moment. We have nitrogen bonded to hydrogen. That's our indicator that hydrogen bonds can occur between multiple molecules of this type. So this is going to have hydrogen bonding, which we know is going to be our most um, strong intermolecular force. So pretty high boiling point is what we would expect here. Helium, um, not even a molecule, it's just an atom. The only thing it's going to experience are dispersion forces. And remember, that's induced dipole, induced dipole, same thing. I just call them dispersion because they're easier, it's easier to say and shorter to write. Um, helium is not even going to have very strong dispersion forces because it's not a very polarizable molecule. It only has two electrons, and uh, it's unlikely that 
that it's going to feel a, a high polarization. And this should make sense because we know helium as a gas has a really, really, really low boiling point. Um, down here we have CH3F. We should see automatically there's going to be a big dipole moment here. Fluorine's very electronegative and it's going to pull electron density towards this side. Uh, so, in a sample of many of these molecules, we're going to have CH3Fs sticking together with dipole-dipole moments. We just need to decide if it's uh, potentially hydrogen bonding. And in this case, the conditions for hydrogen bonding aren't met. It's a carbon-fluorine bond, which is pretty electronegative, but it's <coughs> not going to meet the conditions for hydrogen bonding. So this is just dipole-dipole intermolecular forces. And then over here, methane, nonpolar molecule, so it's not going to have dipole-dipole or hydrogen uh, intermolecular forces. It is only going to have dispersion forces. Remember, everything has dispersion forces. They're just really weak. So when we're looking at these other molecules that have things in addition to dispersion forces, we only focus on the dipole forces, because the, the permanent dipole forces, because those are so, so much more influential. So now let's rank them. We know our dispersion forces are going to, our molecules with dispersion forces are going to have the lowest um, boiling points. And in this case, we have two here. The one with the least amount, or the weakest dispersion forces, are going to be helium. So that's going to be our lowest boiling point. I'll rank it number one. Um, helium is the least polarizable, smaller in size than methane down here. So methane is going to have the second lowest boiling point. It's pretty low. And this should make sense because we know that methane is um, a greenhouse gas. It's around us in the atmosphere and methane uh, present as a gas at room temperature. Next up we have our dipole dipole force. It's a stronger intermolecular force, but on the on the ranking scale it's it's around medium. So this is going to be the third highest boiling point and then or the third lowest boiling point. And then NH3 or ammonia is going to have the highest boiling point because its molecules can um, stick together with hydrogen bonds. So there's answer three. Um, 3A, I should say. 3B, you should be able to rank a couple of them, but it gets really tricky. You wouldn't see something of um, the complexity of 3B on a test. You can give it a try if you want, but don't worry about um, spending too much time on that one. 3C is also pretty important. 3C, we have um, methane, silane, I don't even know how to say those last two, GEH4, SNH4. We should notice that those are the same types of molecules. We're just going straight down, um, the, the central atom, excuse me, is increasing down the periodic table every time. So we have carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin as the central atom. So here, if we drew these four molecules out for 3B, you would realize that they all have the same structure. They're all nonpolar. So the only intermolecular forces that those are going to have are dispersion forces. Then we need to figure out which one has the greatest dispersion forces. And if you remember from the textbook, um, the more polarizable a molecule is, the higher the dispersion forces. So in this case, the most polarizable molecule is going to be the one with the biggest electron cloud and the most amount of electrons. And in that case, it is the SNH4. Then we should have GEH4. Um, it's the next most polarizable, so it'll have the next highest boiling point. And then SiH4 and then CH4 would have the lowest boiling point of those four compounds. And then the last ones that I want to go over are in the next set. Problems 2, 3, and 4. So I'll only do one on a whiteboard, and then the rest I'll just verbally give you the answers to. So problem 2, this is on the next to last page, um, looks like this. Oh, as a side note, if you wanted to skip problem one, that's fine. I thought problem one was like kind of hard and confusing for unnecessary reasons. So here's problem two. Um, I'm just going to go over part A on the whiteboard. So I've drawn out each of the molecules in part A with a line structure. And your job is to pick the one with the highest boiling point. So you may want to pause the video and see if based on these line structures, if that helps you, if you still agree with your original answer. What we should see, though, we're looking for highest boiling point. It's going to be the one with hydrogen bonding capabilities. So only one of these molecules has hydrogen bonding capabilities. Several of them have dipole-dipole, will have dipole-dipole intermolecular forces, but only this one is going to have hydrogen bonding capabilities because this is the only molecule that has an N, O, or F um, covalently bonded to hydrogen. Okay. 
Here we have dipole-dipole forces. Here we're going to have dipole-dipole forces. Here we're going to have weak dipole-dipole forces. Here we're only going to have dispersion forces. This one we're going to have hydrogen bonding, so this is the one with the highest likely boiling point. Um, for letters B and C, you could try drawing those out, but hopefully you realize in B and C there's an ionic compound in each of those answer choices. Ionic compounds have really high boiling points because remember, the attractions between the ions, the positive and negatively charged ions, are super high. It makes their boiling points ridiculously high to separate those ions. So hopefully you picked out the ionic compounds in letters B and C. And then for number three, which of the following liquids does not exhibit hydrogen bonding? If you um, want to pause the video and try to redo your answer to this, if you felt uncertain, do so now. Um, I will tell you that the answer is the second molecule in the list, CH3CCH3 with the double bonded O. So no hydrogen bonding in that molecule. And that's a ketone. Hopefully you recognize that. Um, that's actually two propanone. So we have three carbons in the backbone. The ketone functional group is on the second carbon. Number four says which is the hardest to break? And you have five different answer choices here. The answer to number four is C. The HF bond in hydrogen fluoride is going to be the hardest to break. That's the most um, polar covalent bond out of those in the the options here. And if you were to look up bond energies for um, some of these bonds, you would see that this does have the highest bond energy. Okay, so if you have any more questions about this stuff, uh, feel free to email me or come see me outside of school to ask, and we may have a few minutes in class to go over any other questions that were unanswered. So have a great weekend.